Hey everyone, welcome back to another TEAS lesson. Today we're going to look at the cardiovascular system and the blood. So usually those two chapters are related, so I'm going to put them together. And also there's really not too much change for those two topics, which is really good news. All right, now let's look at some of the details. Okay, so when you look at this comparison table, you can see all the learning objectives are the same, right? Except for some of the verbs they're using in the learning goals. So for example, in T6, they say demonstrate knowledge of the function of the cardiovascular system. And in T7, they change it to explain the functions, right? Which is essentially the same. And when I looked at the practice questions in the study, in the two study manuals, and they are exactly the same as well. So that's also good news. Now in T7, the lymphatic system is included in the cardiovascular system. So if you have a hard time um, locating the lymphatic system, when you look at the table of contents, you don't see a separate chapter. This is why. Now, one thing I want to point out is that make sure you are familiar with the heart diseases. T7 study manual lists, lists quite a few. So I have them all shown here. Now I did go over these heart diseases in my previous cardiovascular video for T6. So they are included in the previous video. So you can uh, take a look at the video if you're not very familiar with those diseases and you want to know what the causes are for those pathological conditions. Okay, so that's the only thing I want to point out because the study manual uh, does mention you need to be able to explain some of the pathological conditions with the cardiovascular system. Okay, now in terms of blood, there is a little bit new information in there. So I will go through um, these um, minor changes know that the blood has two main components, right? Now, it's very easy. Blood has that liquid component and has the solid component, all right? So I'm just using plain language to kind of help you remember. The liquid part of the blood is called a plasma. Now, you probably have heard that some people can donate plasma, right, and get paid for doing that. So that's the liquid part of the blood. Now, the, pro the plasma is mostly water, but it does contain a lot of um, useful substances. So for example, most of the nutrients are uh, dissolved in water, right? Water is the main component of plasma. So plasma can contain all these dissolved nutrients, right? Electrolytes, uh, glucose, and you know, proteins. Plasma also transports hormones, right? So think about this. Um, hormones are for long distance cellular communication, right? So in order for the hormones to reach um, a target uh, organ far away, it needs to be transported long distance uh, and the blood is the perfect system to transport um, anything pretty much long distance. Plasma also contains antibodies. So antibodies are proteins. So they're commonly found dissolved in plasma. And again, that's a very good system, right, to transport antibodies throughout your body to fight pathogens. And plasma also contains different gases, right? When you think about oxygen and carbon dioxide, um, some of these gases are dissolved in plasma. All right, now talking about oxygen and carbon dioxide, you absolutely have to know that Red blood cells, right, RBCs, red blood cells transport oxygen and some carbon dioxide. So how do red blood cells do that? Because they contain a very important protein called hemoglobin. So oxygen and some carbon dioxide combine to hemoglobin. And this is how uh, red blood cells can transport those two gases. Okay, now this information is a little bit new. Um, I have not seen this in T6. So T7 does mention the different types of white blood cells, right? Collectively, they are known as leukocytes. Now, the main function for white blood cells is to defend against pathogens, right? And protect the body. I, I will have some details on the next slide, but let me just go over this real quick. There are two groups of white blood cells. 
we have granulocytes because under the microscope, you can see the little tiny granules in the cells. And there are three types of granulocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and the basophils. And again, I will give you details on the next slide. We also have A granulocytes. So when you look at A granulocytes under the microscope, you don't see the little granule, you don't see the little granules, right? You just see, you know, the cell has a really big uh, nucleus. So in this group, we have a monocytes and lymphocytes. So lymphocytes, they're pretty important. And I, again, I'll give you more details in just a second. Now in blood, uh, for the solid part, oh, I forgot to put it here. So when you look at the solid part, which is known as formed elements, you have a red blood cells, you have a white blood cells, you also have some cell fragments called platelets. Okay, so those are the three formed elements in blood. So pla platelets um, are involved in blood clotting, right? If you get a little cut, you bleed a little bit at first, right? And but eventually the bleeding will stop. So that's partly due to the functions of platelets, right? Those little um, cell fragments can aggregate, right? And they form a plug to seal the opening so that you can stop bleeding. Okay. Now, uh, this information is kind of interesting. This is definitely new for T7. So it mentions that um, about 5 to 7% of the carbon dioxide is dissolved in plasma. And about 85% is used um, to maintain acid-base balance. So you kind of need to know how carbon dioxide is involved in maintaining acid and the base, which is basically pH balance. Okay. So this is what happens when carbon dioxide dissolves in water, um, it can form carbonic acid. Okay. Now carbonic acid can further disassociate. So you have a hydrogen ion and a bicarbonate ion. So when it says bicarbonate, oh, there you go, bicarbonate buffer system, it refers to this bicarbonate ion. Now, because of the presence of bicarbonate ion in the blood, your blood has this buffering capacity. It's going to maintain the pH of the blood to a very narrow range. We all know the importance of the homeostasis, right? We maintain a more or less stable temperature. We maintain more or less stable water content and as you know, also the, the, the blood the pH. So one of the buffers that are commonly present in our body is a bicarbonate ion. So let's say you have an influx of a hydrogen ion. Okay, that's going to make your blood very acidic, right? And then you don't want that you don't want that to happen. So your body can use a bicarbonate ion to absorb that excessive hydrogen ion because they can react and that will form uh, carbonic acid. Okay. Or let's say you have an influx of hydroxide ion. Okay. That's going to make your blood basic, right? Bicarbonate ion can also absorb the hydroxide ion. Okay. So you can see all these are neutral, right? Hydrogen ion, which is going to make the solution acidic, right? That's going to decrease the pH hydroxide ion, right, which basically makes the solution basic, and that's going to increase the pH. Now, if you forget real quick, this is the pH scale, right, 0 to 14, and in the middle 7, that's pH neutral, like water, right, from 7 to 14, that's basic or alkaline, and from 0 to 7, that's acidic. All right. Now, the lower the pH you have, the more acidic the solution is, right? Because you are moving toward that zero end. So that's more acidic. The higher the pH is, the more basic or alkaline the solution is, right? Because you are moving to this 14 value, and that's the highest pH. That's the, the most alkaline pH. So if you move toward that 14 end, it's going to be more basic or alkaline.
Okay, so I just found it interesting that the, the T7 menu uh, mentioned the bicarbonate buffer system, and this system can maintain the normal blood pH. All right, so here is some more information about each of the leukocytes. It might be a good idea to just know the general major function for each, just in case there are questions. So neutrophils, remember these are the most common, most abundant leukocytes in the blood. And they're going to be the first responder to, say, tissue injuries and uh, foreign invaders. Eosinophils, those are leukocytes that are more or less used to fight parasites, but they can also increase allergic reactions. And then basophils promote inflammation, so they can release histamines and uh, increase the nonspecific immune reactions. So right here, they promote inflammation. All right, now for A granulocytes, the first one is lymphocyte. If you remember when we talk about the immune system, when we talk about the lymphatic system, we mentioned lymphocytes, right? And specifically two types of lymphocytes, B cells and T cells. Okay? Uh, B cells produce antibody. So that's very important because a lot of the bacteria or viral infections can trigger that production of antibodies. And we can utilize the antibodies to um, prevent infections, right? Okay, so that has a lot of medical applications. Okay, um, and then the last one, monocytes. Monocytes have a huge appetite for pathogens or damaged cells. So they are phagocytic, meaning they eat other cells. So they can engulf pathogens or worn out cells. Okay, so that's a little bit of information on each of the leukocytes. So I will keep an eye out for these two lessons. If I see any kind of new formats of questions like multiple responses or fill in blank or the ranking uh, questions, I will make sure to give you guys some examples. Okay, all right. Now, thanks for watching. I will see you guys next time. Thank you.